I've been asked to speak to you about quality of growth, body composition, and longer term metabolic outcomes. My name is Nina Modi. I'm a neonatologist at Imperial College London. And let me give you a brief summary of my talk because we only have 20 minutes. So I will be covering uh, body composition as a biomarker of metabolic risk. I will briefly then talk about the long term metabolic outcomes of preterm infants. And finally, I'll speak about what is currently known about influences upon infant body composition. So first of all, I want to really, really impress upon you that body composition is a, a superior biomarker of metabolic risk in adults than is a body mass index. And it's important to recognize this. Uh, and it's illustrated by this famous picture here, which was published in The Lancet way back in 2004, which has two um, clin clinician scientists. Uh, you will see John Yadkin on the, on the left and Chitranjan Yadjnik, who is an Indian scientist from, on the right. Now they both have a very similar height, a very similar build, and you'll see that John's BMI is 22.3 and Ranjan's BMI is 22.3. But when they measured their body fat, their body fat content is very different. John's is just under 10, he's very lean, and Chitranjan, although he's very slim, has a, a body fat content of over 20%. So this shows us why body mass index alone can be very misleading. Body mass index is a marker of metabolic risk only at the upper and the very lower ends of BMI. But for the range in the middle, it is not a good biomarker. And this is why attention has turned to body composition. Now, the other, uh, another example of why body composition can be an important biomarker for altered metabolism in adults is summarized in this slide here. So this is a Canadian research paper from 2006, but there are many such papers. And in the diagram, you will see here on the vertical axis, the risk of death. On the horizontal axis, the amount of internal abdominal adipose tissue, visceral adipose tissue. And this participant in this study here, participant B, who um, has got a twofold higher risk for mortality than participant A. And participant B has got double the amount of intra-abdominal adipose tissue. You will see this single slice CT scan showing participant B's intra-abdominal adipose tissue color-coded in red, showing much, much more than participant A. So the distribution of adipose tissue is also a marker of um, altered metabolism and metabolic risk. But that, however, is in adults. Now, I'm gonna to move to the next part of my talk, which is about the adult phenotype of the very preterm infant. And again, uh, a decade ago, we published some research in pediatric research, which compared young, outwardly healthy adults who were born below 20, 32 weeks gestation and compared them with full-term healthy adult, young adults. And what we found was that the men who had been born preterm had an average increase of around half a kilo in internal abdominal adipose tissue. We also found that their hepatic lipid content was three times higher than term-born counterparts, and they had an increase in blood pressure. And although the preterm individuals had a lower body mass index, their waist-hip ratio was higher and of course that would be in keeping with them having a higher internal abdominal adipose tissue. So this suggested to us that perhaps young adults who'd been born preterm would be at higher risk of cardiometabolic complications. But we concluded from that, those studies that preterm adults appear to have a body composition phenotype indicative of metabolic risk. So we next asked the question, what evidence is there of um, altered metabolic risk in young adults born preterm. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis we published in 2013, which shows that adult systolic and diastolic blood pressure is higher in individuals born uh, prematurely. And this shows you that they have on average a 4.2 millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure, and on average a two and a half millimeter increase in diastolic blood pressure. And these are very substantial in, in increases. There are data from around the world too that show increased risk for preterm 
adult individuals in childhood and later life. So here you've got some data from uh, showing the risk of ischemic heart disease, which is inversely related with gestational age. This comes from Casey, Casey Pump's study in 2019, published in JAMA Pediatrics. The, um, again, the vertical line shows the adjusted hazard ratio for ischemic heart disease. The orange line marks that for preterm individuals. And you will see that this is substantially increased over full-term individuals, which is the black flat horizontal line shown here. You can see other data. This is data for preterm individuals and their risk of type one and type two diabetes. Again, this is data from Casey Crump's group. Um, on the left here, you'll see the adjusted hazard ratio for type one diabetes with this red line showing less than 30, four weeks gestation individuals. This is, um, this is uh, for females and the red dotted line showing males here, showing an increased hazard ratio over full-term individuals. And similarly, a very much increased hazard ratio for type two diabetes as well. So preterm births associated with approximately 1.2, 1.3 fold increased risk for type one and type two diabetes at the age of uh, under 18 years. Now, metabolic syndrome is also higher in adults born preterm. These are data, um, these are data from Finland. You can see here the prevalence of hypertension, obesity, metabolic syndrome and fatty liver index, raised fatty liver index in early preterm individuals in the dark bars, um, late preterm in ha hashed bars and controls in the white bars, again showing their increased risk. And if you're interested in reading more about this, please go to the Neonatal Update Special Edition of Early Human Development, November 2020, which summarizes the risks for preterm individuals in adult life. So the summary of that second part of my talk is that preterm individuals are at greater risk of a range of cardiometabolic disorders and other chronic long-term conditions, including reduced lifespan. Now, what influences are known uh, uh, upon infant body composition? Well, a large body of literature shows that infant adiposity and infant body composition is influenced by sex, birth gestational age, whether or not the, child, the infant is breast or formula fed, their protein intake, their maternal adiposity, whether their mothers had gestational diabetes and their ethnicity. And very briefly, I will show you um, some of the data uh, in relation to these influences. So first of all, some data from my own research group, which goes back to 2005. This was a study in which we used whole body magnetic resonance imaging, um, uh, taking images of the baby sequentially, sliced through the body as it were, and we showed that there was increased internal abdominal adipose tissue in, excuse me, excuse me. There was increased internal abdominal adipose tissue in preterm infants when they reached the age of full term. And that was published in Pediatric Research in 2005. So outwardly, these pre, very preterm babies at the age of term equivalent looked very thin. But if you measured their body composition using whole body MRI, you found that they had an increase in internal abdominal adipose tissue. We also found using uh, liver spectroscopy, proton spectroscopy, that intrahepatocellular lipid is increased in the preterm and term infant. And we replicated that in a number of studies. So you can see here, um, uh, the first panel shows a very small fat peak in full-term babies and a much higher fat peak in preterm and term individuals. And I repeat again that intra-abdominal adipose tissue and increased liver fat are risk factors for later onset metabolic conditions. Now, what about the effects of formula feeding versus breastfeeding? Well, we published a systematic review and meta-analysis in 2012. And here we've plotted on the y-axis the differences in fat mass, so in adiposity, this is on the y-axis, against age up to the age of one year. So this is age in days up to the age of one year. And the remember, higher higher fat mass in formula fed infants will be shown by a vertical line above this horizontal and a lower 
um, fat mass in formula-fed infants will be shown below the line. And what you can see is that formula-fed infants have got a lower fat mass than breastfed infants at three to four months and six months. But then there is a reversal by 12 months and the difference is no longer apparent. And there appears to be a trend towards a higher fat mass in formula-fed infants. Now, we also showed that uh, fat-free mass, this is fat-free mass displayed in exactly the same way, sh um, showing that formula-fed infants have a higher fat-free mass throughout infancy than breastfed infants. So very intriguing data, which, don't pre which present a complex picture. Let's turn to some other data. So this is a randomized controlled trial, so very strong data indeed, but this is in full-term babies. And this was the childhood obesity, the pan-European childhood obesity project, which was a randomized controlled trial enrolling healthy full-term infants randomizing them to receive a higher protein or a lower protein formula in the first year. And the data that have emerged from this study are extremely interesting. I re recommend you read the papers, but the summary is that infant formula with a lower protein content, reduced body mass index and obesity risk at school age. So suggesting now that a lower protein content than was formerly used in, in formula products for full-term babies was protective against obesity. Um, and um, what we've also done is some studies showing the influence now of maternal body mass index on infant adiposity and hepatic lipid content. And again, because time is tight, in summary, I can say that infant adiposity and hepatic lipid increase across the normal range of maternal BMI. In other words, the more obese a mother is, the more adipose tissue her baby is going to have and the more hepatic lipid her baby is going to have. What about mothers with gestational diabetes, which is a rising problem throughout the world? Well, again, we did an observational study comparing babies born to mothers with gestational diabetes and babies uh, born to healthy mothers. And the summary results are shown here. There were no differences in body composition at birth. And again, we studied body composition using whole body MRI. But by the age of three months, total adipose tissue was greater in the babies born to the mothers with gestational diabetes. And it was quite a substantial difference of 16%. We, all, we also curiously found that uh, this was the case, even though these mothers had very good glycemic control, they did not have an increased body mass index, um, and they predominantly breastfed. In other words, showing that breastfeeding does not appear to protect babies born to mothers with gestational diabetes from developing increased adiposity. And finally, I would like to just show you some data, summarize some data where we compared infant adiposity. These were healthy full-term babies born to either white Caucasian mothers in London or to Asian Indian mothers in London. So the mothers were healthy, the babies were healthy, but the Asian Indian ba newborn babies in comparison with their white European counterparts had significantly greater absolute adiposity in all compartments, uh, all abdominal compartments, despite the similar whole adipose tissue content. And so we suggested, and you can read this paper in pediatric research, we suggested that there are differences in adipose tissue partitioning by ethnicity, which are apparent at birth. So let me end with the question, is infant body composition a biomarker of later cardiometabolic risk? And the answer is um, that although childhood and adult body composition is a biomarker of metabolic risk, we still don't know whether um, body composition in infancy is a biomarker for later risk. So we need, in order to answer this question, we need a study of longitudinal cohorts to determine the predictive value of infant body composition on long-term health, and also to establish the extent to which body composition tracks through infancy into adult life. And finally, we need a lot of longitudinal studies to address the impact of infant nutrition on body composition and on later metabolic outcomes, taking into account the many known confounding factors that I have explained to you. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sorry this has been such a rush because we have very short time, but I'd like to end with recommending you read the references I've mentioned 
And also, I would like to invite you to join the Neonatal Update 2021. Uh, this is a flagship meeting of Imperial College, London, discussing the science of newborn care. It will be held between November 23rd and December 3rd. And if you go to our website, you will find further information about the Neonatal Update. So many thanks indeed for listening to me. And that brings me to the end of my talk.